know what's right for them, what's best for them, and therefore if we ask people what will cause them to change their behaviour, then they will give us an accurate account of what will change their behaviour, and therefore we can design programmes and campaigns and communications that align with those desires, those needs and those wants. Um, there's a problem here though. Turns out we're not that good at predicting what does influence our behaviour. We're actually quite poor at identifying those factors that will influence our behaviour, particularly those behaviours in the future that come about automatically. Um, one of my favourite examples is a, a wonderful set of studies uh, conducted by a couple of my colleagues, Wes Schultz and Robert Cialdini over in the <coughs> United States, who went to a large number of households in a particular neighbourhood <coughs> in the United States and asked the owners of these homes which messages would most motivate them and persuade them to change their behaviour in relation to their energy consumption in their homes. So essentially what messages would most motivate households to reduce their energy consumption, maybe you know, turn their thermostats down a little, uh, engage in some uh, pro-environmental types of changes that would be protective of the environment and would actually save these homeowners money. Okay? And here's what the householders told them. The overwhelming response from homeowners was, if you can tell me that if we make these changes, it will increase our environmental protection of our society, that will be the message that will most influence and persuade us to change our behaviour. Okay. Some households said, do you know, we're probably more interested in the impact in the future. So if you can show us how these changes will influence our children's future, make society and the environment better for our children and our children's children, those will be the messages that will be most persuasive to us. Some people simply told them, you know, if you can show me how we can save money, then that will be the message that will most motivate and persuade us. Very few people, interestingly, said, do you know, if I see that my neighbours are starting to do these things, then I'll probably do those things as well. So that's what people told these researchers what would influence their behaviour. Now, the problem with asking people what will persuade them or motivate them in the future, it's kind of like asking someone, tell me how you'll behave in the future when you're not thinking about what I'm asking you about now. That kind of makes sense. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so the recommendation here is that I think increasingly we probably need to be a little less like Michael Parkinson and ask people questions, and a little bit more like David Attenborough and just watch what they do in their natural environment. And that's exactly what happened in these studies. So taking these uh, res responses from neighbours, Wes and Bob then went to a comparable number of their neighbours who lived opposite. And on certain days, simply asked them to hang on the front of their homes a little door hanger as an indication that they had done something environmentally <coughs> friendly that day. So now all these people who say that their neighbours have no influence over their behaviour whatsoever, on certain days, see a sign that their neighbours are behaving in this way. And then that's when you send the undergrads out and have them start to measure their energy consumption, their metres, weigh their recycling, their rubbish, these kind of things. And here's what you find. What people predict will influence their behaviour in the future had no effect at all. It was only when they saw evidence of what their neighbours were doing that it had any effect. But interestingly, both prior to that intervention, people said it would have no effect. And interestingly, uh, there are good uh, data that suggests that even after the event, when we're presented with information about what did influence our behaviour, we'll come up with a nice story which makes us the exception to the rule. Influence and persuasion and change is largely stuff that happens to other people, right? You will know uh, in your mind uh, exactly what does influence and persuade you. It's, it's what actually happens to other people. Um, of course, the uncomfortable reality is it simply isn't. Um, oftentimes, uh, other people are much, much more um, effective at predicting how you're going to behave than you are yourself. So, um, 
talk about this in the context of, uh, so I'm going to talk about Mindspace. So just by way of show of hands, how many people have either read or heard of the Mindspace report? Um, a few of you, okay. So I'll talk a little about what, why, what the Mindspace report is in a few moments time. I think from a public policy and a health perspective, it's a very good set of robust effects that we can use as a set of tools to influence and change behavior. But before we do that, uh, let me talk a little briefly about why it is that these effects have so much power and uh, where they come from in terms of the, uh, the literature. So very, very briefly, I'm going to show you a quick uh, picture on the screen. Uh, would you be willing, once I click the button, to just shout out the first thing that comes to mind? You would? OK, right, so here we go. Uh, let me know what's happening here. Angry. Welcome home, darling. <laughs> okay, here's another one. Oh. Oh. Okay, right, so we've got the required response there. So what's going on here? Um, we talk about this one brain, two systems. By the way, your brain does not have two systems and two brains. It's a nice metaphor, and I think it's a good metaphor for talking about uh, attention, essentially. Okay? Now, when you see this picture here, you know that this woman is angry, she's upset about something, and it's probably a good idea that you get out of the way. You know that instantly. You didn't have to think about it. It was an automatic, unconscious, immediately parallel processed response to this. Get out of her way, she's angry. Okay? And that is what uh, someone like Daniel Kahneman, the author of Thinking Fast and Slow, a cognitive psychologist, Winner of the Nobel Prize in Economics, interestingly, even though he's never taken a formal class in economics, um, would suggest is a function of system one thinking. It's automatic, it's quick, it's immediate, and it controls the overwhelming majority of your everyday behaviours. Okay. This one here, though, mm, it's a little bit different, isn't it? This requires us to engage what uh, Danny would suggest is a system two response. We have to think about this. We have to work hard. We have to uh, invest time and energy uh, in an effort in order to work out that 17 times 24 actually equals 408. There we go. There we go. Um, and it's something that we prefer to do less of. Okay? When we talk about these systems, you know, the reason that system one processing has such an immediate effect is that it is fast, it's intuitive, it's always turned on. It can deal with many things at the same time. Okay? Whereas system two is slow, it's ponderous, it's kind of lazy. It can only work in a sequential way. It can only think about one thing at a time. Yeah? So if you think about it, when we come to think about changing behaviours and getting people to change their minds, oftentimes a significant part of our campaign is directed at this system two part of the brain, isn't it? We try to engage people's thinking, we try to get people to think hard about why they should change, about all the different pros and cons, the upsides and the downsides of why they should listen to our message, come to these kind of informed decisions about what the right course of action is. And I think sometimes we do do that, particularly if there is a decision at hand that is central to us, that is very salient, that is very important for us. We can do that, but it's not something that we actually prefer to do. Okay? Much prefer to work uh, in an automatic way, to go with the grain of how this kind of reptilian part of our brain has helped us to survive over the years. And so here's, I guess, the insight. If we want to change people's behavior, why don't we create campaigns and strategies that talk to that part of the brain that actually controls the overwhelming majority of our everyday decisions? Or put another way, if we want to change behaviors, we want to design campaigns that speak to system one first. And this is where I think this Mindspace report uh, is an extremely effective tool to enable us to do that because it describes nine of the most robust effects from these decades of uh, behavioral and social sci sciences that typically speak and engage with system one first. Okay? 
And what I'd like to do uh, throughout the course of uh, the rest of my time with you until uh, we break for coffee is to talk through each of these nine effects in turn, give you a definition, give you an example uh, from some of the literature, and then maybe start to point to their <coughs> practical application in, with the, some of the challenges that you actually face. So that's my plan. But before I do that, um, you know, I've been talking for you know, 20 minutes or so, maybe it might be just a good time to pause and see if there are any questions, any points of view in the room, any matters of clarity before we, uh, we talk about these effects in turn. What do we have here? And it allows me to get a glass of water as well. No. Okay. So everyone's looking at everyone else going, who's going to ask the first question? It's like yeah, watching the car crash. Isn't it? Hello. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I'm particularly interested in whether your thinking applies to children and young people, so those are the services that I'm particularly involved with. So just a sense of whether these principles completely apply to children and young people in so what way? Yeah, okay. Uh, so the question here is, uh, will these effects, will these principles apply to children and young people? Um, well, and, and let me broaden that out and actually say, how do these effects, how are they likely to work across all types of different peoples, young and old? Uh, cultures, um, you know, uh, does the cultural ethnicity or uh, origin of an individual affect how these principles work, etc., etc.? Um, and the general answer is that because they are principles and effects of the human condition, Okay, they should have a universal application. Okay? Now, I'm not suggesting that some aren't more salient to some groups than others, and we can probably talk a little bit about that once we've gone through each of the effects. But these are largely first-order effects. Um, and that's good news, actually, because, you know, as Craig suggested, you know, if you have uh, large numbers of people, audiences to engage with, you know, it can be very costly to think about how you would individualize and tailor and customize uh, a, a single strategy into lots of different ways. Because of the universality of these effects, um, it means that we can generally move the majority of people in a useful direction most of the time by using them, which frees up those necessary resources for those tricky cases, those difficult, <coughs> burdensome challenges. It frees up resources for us to be able to um, to deal with those, rather than what you often see in policy is trying to deal with the lowest common denominator first, and then hoping that everyone else follows. So, good question. Anything else? Are we uh, ready to go on? Mm -hmm. This is the bit where you all go, yes, Steve, we're excited about this. And, uh, yes, we're really yeah, excited. There we go. <laughs> we're getting there. Okay, so messenger. Let's talk about these nine mind space effects. So the first is the M stands for messenger. Here's a simple one-line definition, okay? In this crazy information overload <coughs> world in which we live in, where oftentimes it's difficult to work out what the right thing to do is, we will often pay more attention <coughs> not to what is being said, but to who is saying it, okay? It's the messenger who is today's messenger. Uh, sorry, it's the messenger who is today's message, not the content of the message itself. As a result, our behavior can be significantly influenced by those individuals that we see as credible, trustworthy, knowledgeable <coughs> experts. In fact, for each of these effects that we'll talk about this morning, there are certain characteristics that you would be well advised to consider that make up these uh, effective uh, principles. And for a messenger, there are three things that um, are going to be important, okay, that make up the ultimately most effective messenger. The first is that they have some form of expertise. And they are able to convey that expertise early on in their appeals. The second is that they have trustworthiness with their audience. And the third thing is, is that ideally, they also have some sort of similarity with their audience. If as a communicator, you can position your message in the context of expertise, trustworthiness, and similarity, the effect it has in terms of persuasion rises considerably. Okay. So let me give you an example. This is a, a series of studies that was conducted by a colleague of mine in the United States uh, in health. Um, but then I have an update for you in terms of how we have now replicated this uh, in GP surgeries. 
uh, here in the United Kingdom. So here's the situation. Uh, patients in uh, a medical facility are newly diagnosed with uh, type 2 diabetes. Okay? Uh, big problem, I understand. Okay. And as a result of this diagnosis, the diagnosing physician is going to hand over the treatment of this individual to a qualified nurse practitioner who is schooled and experienced in managing diabetes, in offering uh, dietary advice, uh, keeping blood sugars at a reasonably <coughs> constant level, these kind of things. This is a, a familiar scenario to you, yeah? yeah? Yeah, okay. So, the question is, what impact does the way that that nurse is introduced to the patient have on the patient's satisfaction and confidence in the system. Okay? Now, let's think about this for a minute. We kind of really know what happens in most every day-to-day -day health interactions. We go to see our doctor, the doctor tells us that we then need to go and see someone else or our care is gonna be handed over to another healthcare <coughs> professional. And we're sent in the direction of a clerk to make an appointment uh, or told that a letter will come to us, etc., about when that appointment is going to occur. Okay? And in those instances, here's what uh, you find. So what uh, NIDA did was to say, in those instances where the doctor simply says, because of your condition, you have to see the nurse, we're going to make an appointment for you. They then measure the subsequent confidence and satisfaction rated by that patient in those healthcare professionals. And here's what you find. The confidence in the doctor remains largely high. He is, after all, that person's family doctor. But it's diluted in the nurse practitioner. Okay? Now, here's the small change that was made that aligns to this nice messenger effect that we're talking about here. If the doctor instead says, at the point of the handover, because of your condition, you are going to require uh, an appointment with our nurse specialist, and then gives that individual two simple pieces of truthful information about why that nurse is the expert, something different happens. So, because of this condition, you're going to need to see Mary the nurse. Mary has over 20 years experience managing patients with a condition similar to yours. Uh, she has extensive training in the management of diabetes. She'll be able to advise you about your nutrition, your diet, keeping your HbA1c levels down. I'd like you to go and make an appointment. Look what happens. This is astonishing. These effect sizes are huge. You know, to get 70 and 80 percent increases in confidence and satisfaction. And here's what I think is especially interesting and insightful about this. The opportunity was there all along. It doesn't cost any extra money. It doesn't cost really any extra time, and maybe five or six seconds to do that introduction. But actually, the, the longer term efficiency you get with the time back is more than pays for it. So my question is this. If you are responsible for delivering important health messages or providing health services, how are you currently introduced? I don't know if uh, the silence is an indication of, well, actually, we probably aren't, or whether it's no one else is saying anything, so I won't say anything either. <laughs> so, but I think here, the point is well made. And here's what we have now done in terms of replicating these effects in the UK here. So across a series of GP surgeries in North London, one of the things that we've actually found is, is that the way that a healthcare professional is introduced in the early stages is super, super important and can have significant impacts on some of the challenges that we face in terms of demand and capacity management. Okay? So we have this very romantic view here in the United Kingdom because we are given a family doctor our own GP. We have this rather romantic view that he or she is sitting in their consulting room waiting for us to call them when we need them. Yeah? When the reality is clearly often different. You know, sometimes it's quite a challenge to get an appointment with said family doctor. 
But sometimes there are other people in the system that are available for us to see. You know, there are locums, there are junior doctors. Things like By the way, no one really wants to see the junior doctor, right? But what we found is if that junior doctor, a GP registrar on a rotation in GP surgeries, is introduced as the newly qualified medic from St. Mary's Hospital or Imperial College or UCL, suddenly the context changes. Oh right, well I definitely want to see this guy. In fact, he's probably better for me to see than the old guy that I've been seeing for the last 15 or 20 years. He's probably a little bit out of date now. And what they're finding is that simply asking for receptionists to introduce or make salient that medic's experience and qualification first before they offer the appointment. In terms of things like third available appointment, which is a Royal College of General Physicians, uh, practitioners rather, sorry, just got back to the US, practitioners um, measure of uh, demand and capacity and, and availability in GP systems, um, comes down <coughs> significantly. You know, where anything between five and eight days was the wait time for a GP appointment, by rebalancing that demand and capacity, they're getting like three days third available reduction. So they, they're essentially halving it just by thinking not about what resource is available, but by how those resources are being introduced. Health. Well, one of my favorite examples of this comes from a set of studies. Uh, Shelley Chaikin and Beth Mayowitz, uh, social psychologists over in the US, uh, finds that actually it can be rather effective sometimes in health messaging to rather than point out what people will gain if they move in a certain direction, make a particular choice, behave in a certain way, it can be much, much more action orientated if you tell people what they'll lose if they fail to take action. Um, so this is in the context of uh, information leaflets. Uh, in this instance, encouraging women to conduct a monthly self-examination um, looking for any abnormal changes, any lumps or bumps that may appear. Um, and uh, two conditions here. The first condition, uh, some people are presented with a message that actually says, here are the upsides for conducting this monthly self-examination. Okay? You'll be in a much better position to notice any small abnormal changes as they occur. Okay? Second group, however, are told, if you fail to do this, then here's what you lose. You lose the opportunity to find any abnormal changes as they occur. And they compared then the compliance to this health recommendation uh, four months later. Um, and what they found was that actually this message here that presented the upside of doing it was no more effective, no more effective than doing nothing. It was only this message here that pointed out what stood to be lost that had any statistically robust influence over future behavior. So the message here might be a little uncomfortable, but it seems that even in health, losses loom larger than gains. And so therefore, it might be worth considering when you think about constructing health messages to point out what people potentially stand to lose if they fail to consider the recommendation you're actually making. It won't win you any friends, I have to tell you that, okay? People prefer, I think, to hear those things that uh, they'll gain, that they'll benefit from if they move in a direction. Um, but it's not the case that that correlates especially strongly with change. Um, certainly not to the extent that a loss message does as well. So, the, uh, so there's the incentives. The N in Mindspace stands for norms. So. Put simply, much of our behavior comes about rather than being thought about. And where that behavior comes about is often a function of what we see many others around us doing. Okay? And we all know how this works in our everyday life. We probably don't think about it too much, but on that first day on your holiday, uh, you're faced with the choice of which restaurant do I eat in. Um, you'll probably find that you're more inclined and attracted to go to the busier restaurant rather than the empty one. Am I right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, and then afterwards, you know, you'll tell all your friends about this wonderful restaurant that you discovered. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Similarly, if you're in the sports stadium and the game isn't a particularly uh, entertaining one, and a few people start with that kind of Mexican wave thing, you know? Even though you probably don't want to be doing that, okay? There's that kind of, well, I suppose I better go with the flow here, you know, and join in as well, 
Okay. What, what's interesting about Mexican waves, just as an aside, this is a dinner party one for you for the weekend, is they're remarkably consistent in terms of their patterns of behavior. Regardless of what country or what sport, they, nine times out of 10, they go in a clockwise direction. Um, they, are, they have a remarkably steady state of speed between 12 to 14 meters per second as they go around. Uh, remarkably consistent in terms of their width as well, between uh, 20 and 25 seats in width. You can track this, um, something that a geek like I would be interested in. But that, I think, demonstrates the power of our conformity to the behavior of others in a largely unthinking way. And especially when we are uncertain. You know, if we don't know what the right course of action is, and, you know, if someone has a particularly uh, uh, finds themselves in a situation where they have a health challenge that is unfamiliar to them, one could argue that they are going to be uncertain. And in those instances, I think, we are especially likely to be influenced by messages about what others like us have done in a given situation. Okay. So um, I'm going to give you a couple of examples. Uh, the first comes about from a series of studies that um, we became rather well known for back in uh, 2007. Just by way of a show of hands, how many of you stay in hotels, um, either on business or have stayed in a hotel in the last couple of years on a, on a vacation? I should imagine it's most of you. Yeah, okay, good. All right. Have you noticed that the hotel chains have uh, implemented a program that seeks to influence your behavior in some way when you stay in the hotels? I'm talking about those little cards that you find in the bathrooms that are encouraging you to reuse your towels and linens. You seen those? Okay. Um, turns out that if you're a big hotel chain and you can persuade even just like three or four percent more guests to reuse their towels for a little while while they're in the hotel, you can save quite a lot of money. It's about 70 pence a day per room, but if you're a big international hotel chain and you've got hundreds of hotel rooms, hundreds of hotel properties across hundreds of countries, suddenly that 70 pence per room can make an extraordinarily large difference. Now, so one of the things that's kind of interesting for me for, as, a, for, as a persuasion scientist is, is this question of, um, well, if someone is trying to influence a behavior by putting a little card in a bathroom, for example, what's the most effective thing you can say on that card? And it turns out that hotels have found something that's reasonably effective, um, and that's to say, please do this for the sake of the environment. Be an upstanding citizen and reuse your towels and linens, because if you do so, then we'll have less of an impact on the environment. And it turns out that those messages are pretty productive, quite efficient. About a third of hotel guests will reuse their towels and linens if asked to do so. But here's what was interesting. Uh, we actually found that if instead of just saying, please do it for the sake of the environment, we actually instead placed a message that said, honestly, by the way, that the majority of people who stay in our hotels for three nights or longer reuse their towels, we got a 26% increase in that towel reuse. Okay? Now, think about this for a second, little thought experiment. I want you to imagine that you're about to check into a hotel. You with me? Okay, uh, you check in, you pick up your key, you go to the room, uh, you put your bag down in the room on the bed and you think, oh, I wonder if I've got a bath or a shower. So you go into the bathroom and you see propped up against the towels a little card that says, dear guest, did you know that the majority of people who stayed in this room before you <laughs> reuse their towels? Okay, what are you going to think? <coughs> okay, the face says it all there. Yeah, that's what you can think. You think, I don't want to know what the person that stayed in this room before me did. As far as I'm concerned, in fact, I'm sure as far as you're concerned, when you check into a hotel, you are the first person that's ever stayed in that room, right? You don't want to know what people before you got up to in that room, in that bed, in that bathroom that you're about to shower in and sleep in. You don't want to know that. There should be no reason on earth why pointing to people's attention to the fact that someone who stayed in the same room as them reused their towel should have any effect. But it turned out that what Noah and Bob were able to find was it was the single most effective message of all. This idea then that not only are we influenced by what multiple others are doing, we are especially persuaded by what multiple comparable others are doing. And to give you a demonstration of how 
huge and significant these effects can be. Um, let me move on from that infamous Tau study to something that's actually become even more famous. Um, so before the Behavioral Insights team was set up in the Cabinet Office in May 2010, um, someone from the Treasury contacted us and said, we've been reading about these studies you've been doing in hotels in the US and wondered whether or not the same strategy might apply and work for encouraging to people to submit their tax returns on time. Okay? And so we thought, well, let's have a look at what the percentage of people is in the UK that do submit their tax returns on time and pay on time. Turns out most of us do. We're pretty good citizens. Uh, I think primarily because most of us have it deducted at source. We don't have a choice. Um, but it's actually the case that around about 95%, 94, 95% of people in the UK do pay their taxes on time. So what would be the impact if we simply put that sentence across the top of a letter asking people to submit and pay their taxes on time. Okay. And then rather like the TAL studies, what if we went one stage further and then instead of saying here's the percentage of people in the UK that pay their taxes on time, we say here is the percentage of people in your postcode, much like your room. And then add a third a message that actually says, and here are the people in your town, and we name the town, a kind of social identity. So that's what we actually did. The majority of citizens pay their taxes on time. The majority of citizens in your postcode, the majority of citizens in your town. And compared to the control, so the standard letter would typically get about a 67, 68% response rate. We found 72, 79, and 83% response rates. So that's a kind of a linear increase. Uh, now, that's fine in terms of percentages. I think we prefer to talk about the real impact here. In the first set of rudimentary pilot studies that were actually done back in 2009, compared to a comparable debt group from the year before, the clearance rate rose from 57 to 86%, which meant an additional £270 million pounds in collection from a sentence that we added to a letter. That's astonishing. But it's not the amount of money that was collected in addition that surprised me the most. Here's the thing that surprised me the most. You would have thought that someone would have thought about it before we did. <laughs> because when you tell people afterwards, they go, well, that's kind of obvious, isn't it? I knew that. But that's, I think, the inherent problem here is that oftentimes, when we have faced with a challenge, we look to what the best practice is of what other people are doing, okay? And that can be a challenge because best practices won't ever tell us what the most effective strategies are. They'll only ever tell us about what the best practices that are known in a situation. So one, I think, of the other beneficial utilities of this mind space and these uh, behavioral effects is, is that it forces us to think in a way that might inform us of new strategies that we can then test. You know. But that's the biggest insight for me is, is that you know, the Treasury have been collecting taxes for centuries. No one at any point thought, well, let's just like, stick an extra sentence across the top using a social norm. But when we did, massive effect. Okay. Now, uh, one last thing about this. Uh, have you seen any of these? Or do you know about these now? Has Craig like, drilled this into you? <laughs> Um, I think one of the mistakes that we often make when we try to influence behaviour, particularly when we try to reduce undesirable or unwanted behaviour, is we kind of fool ourselves into thinking that if we publish the regrettable frequency of undesirable behaviours, that people will then engage their system too and think, oh, that's terrible that people are behaving in that way. I certainly aren't going to behave in that way. I'm certainly not going to do that. I'm going to tell all my friends not to do it as well. The problem with that, of course, is it's very naive because what we know uh, from a lot of research now is, is that these messages that decry the regrettable frequency of undesirable behaviour do a damn good job of increasing the behaviour even further. For a simple reason. Underneath that message, look at all the people that are doing this undesirable thing, looks a normative message that is essentially saying, look at all the people who are doing this undesirable thing. There's a famous case in the US of a national park who, in an attempt to reduce visitor theft, 
guests and visitors to the park who are hiking and backtracking would pick bits of crystal and petrified wood from the forest floor as a little keepsake. Not only a little bit, but if hundreds of thousands of people are picking up little bits of crystal and petrified wood from the forest floor, taking it home, has a massive impact over a period of time. So in an attempt to reduce theft in the national park, they erected these large signs all over the park, decrying that past visitors were stealing pieces of petrified wood and crystal from the forest floor, and that the, follow the year previous, the park es lost an estimated 14 tons of its heritage. The following year, theft rose almost 60%. It's almost like people are rocking up to the park and going, we better get ours quick then before it all runs out. <laughs> Yeah. It wasn't a crime promotion strategy. It wasn't a crime prevention strategy, it was a crime promotion strategy. Okay? And we find the same here with DNAs. You know, look at all the people that are failing to turn up for their appointments. Well, if I don't turn up then, it probably doesn't make that much of a big difference. Okay? There's a second reason why, if you haven't already done so, my advice would be to rip these damn things off the wall or of any GP or hospital surgery or outpatients department you see. And it's simply because, who sees this sign? Yeah, only the people that turn up, which is kind of like a bit stupid, really. Anyway, <laughs> norms. Right, we're going to move on uh, rapidly. We've got about a half an hour. Are we still okay? Are we still with us? Right, D is defaults. Um, essentially, in a crazy information overloaded world, one of the ways in which we can make a decision is not to actually make a decision at all. Just default people into a preferred course of action. So defaults are especially useful if there are a choice of, say, two behaviours and there is a preferred choice that you would like people to take. Um, it's the reason why people often opt you into those kind of me mailing and marketing messages. Um, essentially, it's encouraging people to make a decision without actually having to get them to make a decision at all. Okay? One of the best examples we know about is from donors, uh, organ donor cards. So in the UK, until recently, when we had an opt-in, you had to tick the box. We had relatively low levels of uh, organ donation carrying cards, uh, in contrast to most European Union countries that have an opt-out. You, you have to say explicitly, I don't want to carry an organ donor card. As a result, they had much, much higher levels you know, between you know, mid-70s to mid-80% of the population would actually do it. So just defaulting people into the right course of action um, so that they are essentially making a decision without really thinking about it is how defaults work. And as I suggested, they largely work best where there is a single course of preferred action. Okay? Um, there are data that would suggest that um, they are also effective, and this is in a health context, when combined with uh, other mind space effects. In this instance, the lost language from the incentive effect. Uh, so Kevin Vollep, for example, is a behavioral scientist uh, especially interested in the application to health over in the US, finds that if you opt people in to receiving a flu vaccine um, and then point out, and I realize that this is a US condition so it would work less well here in the UK, but point out to people um, how much money they will lose in terms of extra premiums they'll have to pay on their health insurance if they fail to get a flu vaccine. That was an especially effective way. Um, but I think that we could take the principle there and, and still think about, well, how could we default people into certain behaviours and then link that behaviour uh, to a message that essentially talks about the, what stands to be lost if they fail to move in that direction. So that's the D in mind space. Uh, the next is salience, the S. Um, our attention is often drawn to what we see as novel or attractive in a given situation. Okay? And it turns out that there's lots of different things that can suddenly become salient to us and uh, attract our attention. Uh, one of them is this idea of um, what we see first disproportionately influencing our perception of the very next thing we see. So uh, let me give you an example. There's um, a phenomena in the social psychology literature that we talk about called contrast phenomena, which essentially says that one way I can change the way you perceive a message I give you is to not change that message at all, but instead to change what I compare it to. Okay? So I'll give you an example. Um, you know that experience when you wake up in the middle of the night and you turn on your bedside lamp and you're suddenly almost blinded by it? Yeah. You with me? Yeah? Now imagine if instead you went in during the day and turned that light on. It would have almost no effect on you whatsoever. Yeah? What changes about the light? 
No, nothing changes about the light. What's instead changed is what you experience immediately before. Darkness or daylight. And it's that experience of what you see first or experience first that influences your perception of the very next message that comes. Okay? So one way in which you can use this idea of salience is to, if you have a message to deliver, if you have a campaign, if you have a strategy that you want to essentially affect people's behavior in terms of changing their behavior, one way in which you can do that is not to think about changing your message at all, but instead changing what you compare it to and positioning that first. Okay? But I think that perhaps the most useful <coughs> an intelligent and simple way of using salience is to do everything possible just to keep things simple. And I think that one of the strategies, uh, rather one of the unintended consequences of trying to change people's minds by informing them into change has been that our messages have become so complex, so burdensome, so arcane, that we just simply disengage people. One of the best examples from recent years is, imagine, can you remember what the search engines were like before Google came along? Alta Vista and Yahoo was this massive page of tiny text and rolling this and that and the other, and you had to work out very, very hard. It took a lot of attention to think, well, where do I search for a restaurant or where do I search for whatever I'm searching for okay it was it was like very very difficult to find Google came along white page type it in the middle here a very good example I think of simple salience okay um, I've got a research uh, assistant uh, that works for me and uh, she did a review of some public communication cam uh, campaigns, letters essentially from that were sent from the borders agencies to students that have come to the UK to study um, and who were either getting close to the expiration of their education visa or had just allowed it to lapse. Okay? And what they simply wanted these people to do was to say, contact us and let us know if you plan to stay in the country so you can extend the application or whether you're going to go home. Okay? The letter ran to almost nine pages. <laughs> it was almost like the request, the message itself was lost because it had come about and been formed by committee. Oh, well, we've got to mention this as well. Oh, and don't forget this. And what if someone is from this country, but they've only got, you know, they're left-handed rather than right-handed? What if they wear glasses and don't have a beard? It was, it was literally that, I mean, I, I pour scorn on it, but it was, you can see how sometimes these communications come about by, by a committee and consensus, and they end up just not having the intended consequence. Um, a similar example, there's a, a series of studies going on at the moment looking to replicate the no-show studies that we'll talk about in a minute um, in mental health, uh, community mental health uh, centres. And some of the initial referral letters and the appointments are extraordinarily burdensome, often with multiple different addresses on. Um, and these are people that are kind of cognitively challenged at the best of times anyway, and we're just making it so much harder for them. Anyway, rant over. Priming is next. Uh, priming is essentially how, describes how our behavior is often influenced in automatic unconscious ways by virtue of the fact uh, of the environment in which we are situated or located in. Okay? So example, um, think about a busy pub on a Friday night, what are the kind of characteristics that are going on in that environment that might actually be persuading or influencing people, without them even thinking about what they're doing, to drink more? Shout a few out. There's no seats, yeah. So if you stand up, you actually will drink likely more frequently than uh, if you're sitting down. So that's one thing. Peanuts on the bar, Peanuts on the bar yeah, let's uh, get a bit of a salty throat there. Loud music. loud music, yeah. If there's loud music, then I can't converse with the person I'm speaking to, and if I can't talk to them, I'm likely to drink uh, quicker as well. Um, constrained spaces, talk louder. talk louder, these kind of things. These are all examples of how people have designed environments in order to influence our behavior without us actually thinking about how we're behaving. Now, 
Think about that in the context of a bigger challenge within the health service, which is this idea that lots and lots of people are turning up to accident and emergency departments uh, largely inappropriately. Okay? Um, and um, I, I have to put my hand up here as part of a piece of research that we did recently. I actually sent someone to an A&E department to see if they could actually get treated. Uh, there was nothing wrong with them at all. Um, <laughs> And I think they complain about a little bit of a headache or something. Uh, they were, far, yeah, they, they got seen, you know. And then they were asked at the end whether or not the satis how satisfied they were with the experience, which was kind of interesting, and whether they'd recommend it to a friend. <laughs> okay. Um, but, but if you think about that, one of the things that might actually be not helpful in that instance is an environment that is largely encouraging people to come because it's an attractive place to be. You know, and you see all these kind of bizarre sometimes behaviours that are occurring where you know, suddenly the A&E department is fitted out with new seats, liquor paint, an aquarium I saw in one, nice classical music, these kind of places. Wonderful nice places to actually be. Certainly more preferable to that dingy GP single-handed surgery down on the corner that's in that old Victorian building that's a bit smelly and has got mold, et cetera, et cetera. No wonder we're encouraging more people to go to the more attractive place, because the environment is nice. And they bring their family and friends as well, OK? <laughs> and then when it gets really, really busy, we do stupid things like build a bus stop outside so it makes it easier for people to get there. Um, and the one thing that we don't see is enough blood and ambulances. So therefore, there is no sign that this is an accident and emergency department. So I'm taking it to a bit of an extreme to prove a point, but the point is this. The way you design environments can have a significant influence over people's reaction and behavior within those environments. Okay? And therefore, you know, um, if we start to design environments that are actually too nice in some instances, um, and then we start to complain about the fact that too many people are using it, well, no surprise, really. Okay, effect is the uh, A in mind space. Simply put, people, people's behavior is often influenced and almost activated by the way they're feeling or their emotional reaction to something. Um, and it, oftentimes it occurs without us even realizing it. So um, we'll all have that experience where we get into an altercation with someone, an argument with someone, and suddenly we're in that kind of situation where we're pitting against someone else, and we don't even know why. Something must have happened that has you know, activated this altercation, but we're in it before we even think about what's actually activated it. Uh, such is the power of these emotional responses. There are a couple of emotional responses that I think are especially important. Um, uh, attractiveness is one. We're much more likely to engage with those things that we actually see attractive, so maybe more fuel on that A&E environmental story. Um, and fear is another one. Uh, fear and disgust, actually. We'll talk briefly about each of those two. Here's the fear one. I quite like this. Um, turns out that when it comes to changing behavior, a little bit of a fear is actually a good thing. A little bit of fear is actually a good thing, provided that it becomes, it's rather accompanied with an immediate action that that individual can take to reduce that threat. Okay, so here's one example, uh, the FAST campaign, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, that led to a significant increase in the number of appropriate reported 999 calls for people that were having trans ischemic attacks and strokes. Uh, another one, back to our friend Kevin Vollett from the US, uh, finds that uh, uh, enrollment in flu vaccinations and immunization campaigns can rise uh, considerably, actually, when people are told about what the risks are if they fail to get vaccinated, and then are given a simple piece of information that will help them get vaccinated. And sometimes that simple piece of information was a map to the immunization center. Okay? The only downside here is um, I am not advocating too much fear. Too much fear can have actually a counterproductive effect, uh, almost like people are burying their head in the sands and not wanting to listen at all. And I think that might go to explain why sometimes uh, smoking cessation campaigns, uh, tobacco-free campaigns, uh, can sometimes backfire or have no effect at all. Um, they are so fear-inducing. Or, or the fear or the implication is framed as so far in the future that our future selves, because they're strangers to us, are likely not to be affected by them. Okay, and uh, two more, commitment. One of the things that we 
prefer to do as a species is to be committed and be consistent to our values, our beliefs and our self-ascribed traits. It's a rather nice attribute to be known about from a societal perspective. You know, if you're known as someone that lives up to their commitments, that, you know, lives up to their promises, is consistent, is largely predictable, they're kind of nice, attractive traits to have and to be known for in a society and in a population. And it turns out that those commitments that we are most likely to live up to are commitments that generally start quite small and are effortful and known to others. Uh, and this effortfulness and publicity is an important aspect. The more the cost of a commitment rises, the more likely we are to be consistent with that commitment over time. Okay. So, give you a couple of examples. It turns out, um, how many of you uh, will regularly fill in forms, maybe your expense forms or forms for insurances or applications for passports or these kind of things. You've all done it, yeah? Most of you? Good. By the way, it's my check to see if you're still awake. <coughs> ah, okay. um, where typically on your expense form, your passport form, your driver's license form, your insurance forms, whatever, are you asked to sign to say that the information you're giving or have given rather is and there's the clue, accurate and honest. At the end, okay? Contrast this with another example that I, I guess probably fewer of you will be knowledgeable about but may have experienced. How many of you have ever given testimony in a court of law? Okay, about a dozen, two dozen of you. When are you asked to make a commitment that you're telling the truth? At the start. So why is it different for forms? Okay, turns out there is uh, a really neat study that shows that if people, before they complete a form, are asked to sign that the information they're about to give is an honest and true reflection of their circumstances, they are more honest and they complete it more fully than the exact same form where they sign at the end. There's an example, I think, of a really small thing, a commitment at the start, that can have a big effect. So those studies were actually conducted with people that were applying for car insurance. And they found that when they were asked to sign at the beginning, uh, they were much more truthful about their annual mileage. They are typically drove about 3,000 miles a year <coughs> more than if they were asked to. Okay. And it turns out, um, and again, it's one of these things that we don't like to learn about, but uh, uh, we're all a little bit dishonest. Um, we all lie a little bit, cheat a little bit, especially those small things that we think that we can actually get away with. Um, I saw a recent study that actually showed, um, rather, uh, that recently um, offered this idea that 92% of people um, admit to being dishonest at some point. Yeah. Which made me wonder, the 8% that didn't, they're really big liars, aren't they? They're, they're really <laughs> okay. But of course, the... Um, the best example, I think, um, and which has been beautifully, beautifully replicated, and you're going to hear a little bit about more later, is this idea of, well, how can we use this effect to reduce things like uh, the number of people that fail to show up for their appointments? Um, the, l the latest data that I've seen is it's somewhere in the region of about £850 million pounds a year is lost from people that simply don't turn up for GP appointments, outpatient appointments, mental health appointments, physiotherapy appointments. Um, and then you get the other one, I guess, uh, you being a community-based health trust and organisation, uh, you probably get the not the D did not attend, but the not at home challenge as well. Okay. And here's what we found, that taking two insights from um, the commitment literature, the first is getting people to verbally repeat back the time and day of their appointments uh, before the receptionist or the health clerk puts the phone down. They're actively rather than passively engaged. Led to a modest but significant reduction of about 3.5% compared to a control. 3.5% um, reduction of an £850 million pound problem in health. Ah, oh, I'm, I'm sure you can put that money to better use than simply pouring it down the drain. And then the other one, of course, was this idea that the more active and the more public 
people are involved in making commitments, uh, it amplifies the effect even more. So those people that were making appointments in GP surgeries, uh, follow-up appointments, these kind of things, um, instead of the nurse or the doctor or the receptionist writing down the details on the card, the blank card was given to the individual to write down themselves. 18% reduction in no-shows, 18% reduction of a multi-million pound problem uh, and we're now in a situation where we can start to kind of build hospitals and GP surgeries and employ more nurses. Um, and I think that's the undercutting message here for me is, is that some of these things are so small, uh, so cost effective, but the upsides are so large that it would be, um, I think, folly not to consider them. There's one last thing about commitments, and it's this idea of um, going first. Um, so. I don't want to get too much into why I think this, but there's another effect from the behavioral sciences, the social influence theory sciences, um, that in the Mindspace report has been bundled into commitment, but I think it's actually an effect in its own right. And it's this idea of reciprocity, this idea that people are more likely or inclined to be persuaded by someone to the extent to which something has been done for them first. Okay? So if a friend of yours invites you to your, their house for dinner one weekend, um, what do you do? Yeah, you invite them back or you take wine or you take flowers or you take chocolates. And similarly, if a friend of yours does you a favor at work or a colleague and helps you out on something, you're obligated to that help that colleague out in the future. Um, and if you don't, by the way, they'll call you names. <laughs> Freeloader, ingrate. Teenagers is another word that we give for people that don't give back and take, <laughs> by the way. Um, but the point here is this. Um, I think oftentimes a lot of the good things that we do, the resources, the facilities, the services that we make available to people are largely invisible to them. And as a result, they can't be obligating. Yeah. There's no sense of obligation to live up to your side of a contract or a bargain or to do something for someone that hasn't done something for you first. In the same way, there's no sense of obligation to help someone or live up to your side of the bargain, to take greater responsibility for doing something for someone who has done something for you first but that you can't see. And so as a result, I think there is likely to be a significant value in you thinking about not just what you are doing for others, but how you can frame what you are doing for others first in such a way that people will feel obligated uh, and as a result live up to their side of the bargain or take greater responsibility. Um, so one brief example, in the uh, TAL studies that I mentioned earlier, there was one uh, card that was rewritten that said, um, Dear guest, um, if you reuse your towels and linens while you stay in our hotel, this hotel will donate a percentage of the savings towards an environmental charity. <coughs> A lot of businesses are doing this now, kind of giving back some of their profits in a, in a kind of social cause marketing type of, or social responsibility type of way. Turns out that when that was done, towel reuse went down. It didn't go up. And the reason it went down was because the order of the exchange was wrong. When the car was changed and said, this is what the hotel has already done for the environment, these are the contributions we made last year because of our program, now please do your bit, there was a 19% increase in that use. So the message oftentimes is, a, is an ordering effect. You do so much for others, but either it's not positioned or presented as first, so it's obligating, or worse still, it's just largely invisible to people. And as a result, how can they feel obliged? And how can they then respond accordingly to a request or a message that you actually give them. Just one last thing, because it's a Friday, um, that effect actually also provides you with about the single most effective way of being persuasive at home. <laughs> did, did you want to hear that one? Yeah. <laughs> Suddenly everyone's pen goes up. Um, so there's a moment, it turns out, in this principle of obligation and reciprocity, where you are especially likely to have someone say yes to a request that you make of them. And it's the moment after thank you. People don't say no to a request after they've said, someone, said thank you to someone. 
Okay? So the message here is, um, if you help someone out and they say thank you to you, uh, what's your typical response to that thank you? Okay. Yeah, that's all right, no problem, all part of the service, think nothing of it. Yeah, stop saying that. <laughs> By the way, don't replace it with, yeah, I did help you and now you owe me. <laughs> don't do that. Don't do that. But a carefully placed message or question at that point in time, yeah, leads to significantly higher levels of compliance. Well, of course I helped you. I know that you would be the sort of person that would do the same for me. Uh, or maybe you could introduce me to such and such a person. Or maybe you could do the ironing or take the, do the recycling tomorrow night or whatever the case may be. Those moments after thank you. So it can work in your personal life as well. And finally, before we uh, break for a few questions and then we uh, get a well-earned cup of coffee for you guys, uh, the E in Mindspace stands for ego. Um, so essentially, uh, we act in ways or we prefer to act in ways that allow us to feel better about ourselves. Okay? So just by way of a show of hands, how many people in the room would consider themselves to be an above average driver? <laughs> the vast majority of you, yeah. How can that be? Yeah? But there's an example of how you know, our thoughts, our perceptions kind of shape our behaviours in ways so that allow us to feel uh, better about ourselves, that, that ego thing. A um, couple of things that I think are especially important. The first one is this idea of self-consistency. Um, one way in which we can um, help people feel better about themselves is to point out how the behaviours we are asking them to or encouraging in them, in them is consistent with other ego-enhancing commitments that they've made previously. Okay? So there's a wonderful, wonderful set of, uh, of studies that um, I think speak very uh, neatly to a challenge that we all know that happens in health, which is um, oftentimes the biggest or the most challenging individual in the health system to influence is not patients, is it? Who is it? And a particular type of staff I often hear. Doctors. It's the doctors, yes. Yeah. Adam Grant, who's a dear friend of ours from the Wharton School of Business, a social psychologist, an absolute star in this field. He ran an experiment a couple of years ago that he published in Psychological Science, which I think speaks beautifully to this idea of self-consistency. What small thing could be done in a hospital environment that significantly increases the number of doctors who will routinely sanitize and clean their hands after they go from bed to bed and move from ward to ward and department to department. Okay? So it turns out there's lots of things that you can actually do. You can pump kind of lemon scent and bleach into the air conditioning and that kind of has, has a priming effect. People are more likely to wash their hands. Uh, but what Adam decided to test was three different types of messages. Uh, the first message was a simple kind of salient message that said, gel in, germs out. Okay? So the gel in, germs out campaign, and we've all seen these types of campaigns, prominently displayed next to the hand sanitizers, randomly assigned across the hospital, and the impact then was compared to just the standard, you know, sanitize your hands. The gel in, germs out campaign had no effect at all compared to doing nothing. Okay? So they thought, well, let's try something else. Let's think about, well, why are doctors doctors? What are they in the business of doing? You know, they're in the business of maintaining health, promoting health. And what better person to promote the health of than themselves? So Adam put on a set of second set of signs up that actually said, by sanitizing, by, you know, sanitizing your hands, you protect you. You're protecting yourself from the transmission of germs, infections, viruses, and things like this. Prominently displayed across these hospitals, again compared to a control where no message, no effect, no effect at all. <coughs> Here's the condition that had the biggest effect, and it was a significant effect, a big, big effect size. Not gel in germs out, not washing your hands between patient consultations will protect you. It's the oath you took as a doctor. Reminding them that they took an oath to protect their patients. It was a self-consistency cue. 
that had the effect. So I think sometimes some ways in which we can encourage people to behave in desirable ways is often just to simply remind them of those commitments they've made in the past that ideally they would like to be self-consistent with over the future. Okay? And it turns out that there is evidence that uh, it's not just those oaths and commitments they've made in the past that we can make self-consistent. We can often also give people labels that require them to live up to those behaviours that we are branding them with. So, let me leave you with this. Okay? Do you recall that the very, very first piece of research that I presented to you was the studies looking at the impact of confidence and satisfaction in patients, um, primarily based on how the nurse was introduced to them. Do you remember that? Okay. Think about this. Think about this now from an ego and a labeling perspective. If our nursing teams, if our healthcare providers, if the staffs in our organization recognize that they are being introduced in this way as credible, knowledgeable, trustworthy, experienced, valuable service providers and experts, should they not live up to those labels we're giving them? Do we get a double whammy effect? Do we not only increase the likelihood that we get uh, improved satisfaction and confidence and one could then test, don't have the data for this yet, but one could then test whether or not those confidence and satisfaction levels that are elevated lead to greater persistence, reductions in DNAs, more compliance to drug regimes, etc., etc. That's the benefit to the patient. But does the system get a benefit as well? Because the staffs are actually being recognized in that way, and we are now giving them labels to live up to. And as a result, are they less likely to be sick? Do absenteeism rates go down? You know, all these other potentially positive spillover effects that didn't come about by any amount of, you know, changing people's minds, didn't have come about by expensive campaigns and change programs, but came about because a set of universal effects that largely go with the grain of how people behave was employed instead. And I think, you know, when you think about these mind space effects, one of the, I think, final thoughts that I'll leave you with is the reason why I believe that what you've been doing up here in recent years with Craig and his team is to be absolutely lauded and encouraged and praised because unlike years gone by we now have good scientific evidence and research to back up these ideas it's not hunch it's not guesses it's not intuition you know so there's one reason why I think it's important that these mind space effects are deployed of course they can be self uh, funding cost effective it doesn't actually cost that much money to arrange for someone's expertise to be introduced, to ask that extra question to encourage a reduction in DNAs, you know, to not perhaps change an environment to make it more attractive so that more people turn up when we don't want them to. These are cost-effective interventions with universal applicability, okay? They are first-order effects. We may in the discussion later and in some of the case studies talk about how they play out across different social groups and social networks, but they have largely universal effects. And you can test and learn how to use them yourself. You know, you don't have to take my word for it. You can take these insights, you can run little experiments, and I really would encourage you to actually do that. Um, and perhaps most importantly of all, um, we can do so without actually taking choice away from people. We're not forcing people into change. We're not creating new laws, legislations and regulations which are burdensome, expensive and, let's face it, just piss people off sometimes. Um, instead we can do it in non-coercive ways. So um, I think for that reason um, there's very, very good uh, data behind this idea of, as a set of tools, um, I think you're in a really neat position to be able to think about how they can apply to some of the challenges you actually face. And I believe that after coffee um, you're going to have an opportunity to hear about some of those very real examples that are occurring here in the Northwest. But thank you very much indeed for your attention. Uh, uh, I think we've got maybe a couple of minutes for questions before we take coffee. But for now, thank you very much indeed. And uh, who do I hand back to? Yes, thanks. Craig. Thank you. Thank you.